let's do our first proof by induction. Let's work with addition and the natural numbers, and we'll just try to add zero to a natural number. Now, if you try to add zero on the left-hand side of a natural number, it doesn't matter what it is, call it n. Actually, we don't even need induction for that. Reflexivity suffices. So here, we can step through the proof, uh, and we've got a sub-goal. We need to prove that 0 plus n equals n. And reflexivity takes care of that entirely on its own, as we would expect from basics. Now, the reason it's able to do that is because of the way that plus is defined. You might recall from basics that it's defined uh, recursively uh, on its left-hand argument. It pattern matches when it sees 0 there. It just reduces to the right-hand argument. So that's why reflexivity is able to do that kind of simplification, as we talked about in the lectures on basics. On the other hand, if you try to add 0 on the right-hand side, that surprisingly gets tricky. Well, maybe it shouldn't be too surprising. Plus recurses on its left-hand argument. It knows nothing about n here when we get to this point in the proof. We have introduced n, so we've instantiated that universal quantifier, and we try to simplify. That doesn't do anything. Uh, reflexivity itself actually isn't going to work either. Uh, unable to unify n with n plus 0. They're not the same term. Really, re remember that one of the challenges is actually when learning cock is you have a built-in notion of your brain of what plus means. So do I. We've learned this from grade school. Uh, we're good at reasoning about addition. But cock, it's not, it, addition isn't special to cock in that way. It's just another function that's been defined. And yeah, there's some pretty infix syntax for it with the plus operator here. But really, it's just that addition function that we defined back in, back in basics. Uh, there's nothing baked in, nothing primitive about this kind of arithmetic. Uh, so really, we're just trying to prove something about the application of a function to some arguments. And Koch doesn't really care what that function is. Okay, It doesn't know how to simplify using all the algebraic rules that you and I know. Now, of course, there are some reasoning techniques in Koch built in for that. Uh, we're going to get to those much later. Right now, our goal is to learn how to use these proof mechanisms like induction, which we're about to do. And it's nice to do those in the context where the problems we're applying them to are ones that are easy for us to think about. It's easy for us to look at n plus 0 equals n and say, yeah, that's got to be true, and then focus on the proof techniques. Later, once we've mastered the proof techniques, we can go to more complicated kinds of problems. OK, so uh, simple doesn't work. Reflexivity doesn't work. Uh, we know about destruct. Maybe we should try destruct. Let's introduce n. Now we can do the case analysis on whether n is 0 or the successor of some other natural number. Recall, there's a syntax for introducing variable names for the data carried along by constructors. And it's called an intros pattern. So this piece of syntax here written in the square brackets is an intros pattern. It's a way of introducing variable names uh, for the data carried by constructors. Now, recall, if you will, that this is sort of like a pattern match. And uh, you might think of it as this is the constructor over here for O. This is the constructor over here for successor. The reason why they're in that order is because that's the order in which the two constructors were defined in the definition of nat, the natural numbers. But we don't write the constructor names there. Uh, instead, we just write the variable name for the data they carry. In this case, O doesn't carry any data. S carries exactly one other natural number. Here, we're going to call it n prime. And recall the syntax here for eqn colon says we want to introduce a hypothesis uh, whose name is going to be e. And that hypothesis will record an equation about which branch of the case analysis we're in. As we proceed through that, we get a subgoal, one for O, another for S. O, of course, is written as 0 because cock puns the notation of the natural numbers with the usual numbers we're used to writing on paper. We'll go past this bullet. That takes us down and focuses into that subgoal. So now we're in the subgoal for where n equals 0. You can see that recorded in the equation here. You can also see that the number n well, it used to be n here on the left-hand side of the goal, but now it's been instantiated with O, with 0, because that's the branch of the case analysis we're in. At this point, we need to prove that 0 plus 0 equals 0. That's old hat for us by now. Reflexivity easily does that. But what about the successor case? Here, we can see the equation has recorded that we are, in fact, in the case where we're looking at the successor of n prime. 
and that successor of n prime has been substituted for n in the goal, what could we do at this point? Well, if we try to simplify, we do make a little bit of progress. Let's undo and think about why that is. In reality, the successor constructor there is applied to n prime. It's not applied to plus zero. So this successor binds more tightly than the plus operator does here. So we're saying that we've got one plus some other natural number, and we're adding that to zero. Recall that the definition of plus, in fact, pattern matches on its first argument. And if it sees a successor there, it's going to strip off that successor and recurse. So that's exactly the step of computation that simple takes here. It strips off that successor, puts it out front, and now we've got to recurse. We've got to add n prime together with 0, whereas before we were adding successor of n prime to 0. OK, so that makes a little bit of progress. But now we're stuck again. Now there's no way to get past that n prime plus 0, because we don't know anything about what n prime is. I mean, I guess you could, if you want, try destructing on n prime here, but this problem is just going to recur again and again and again. That's a good sign that induction is what we need at this point. So recall the principle of induction over the natural numbers. You've probably learned this in a discrete math class or some other kind of math class that you took in the past. The principle of induction could be stated like this. Suppose you want to prove a proposition involving a natural number n. We'll call that proposition p. And you want to show that p holds for all natural numbers. Well, the reasoning pattern, the proof technique that you use, that we call induction, is first off to show that p holds of 0. We often call that the base case. Then, separately, show that if p holds of some arbitrary natural number n prime, then p also must hold for the successor of n prime, or 1 plus n prime, the next bigger natural number. If you can do both of those things, show the base case and show this second step here, which is often called the inductive step or the inductive case, then you're allowed to conclude by the principle of induction that p of n holds for all natural numbers n. You've probably seen proofs like this in the past. Well, here's how we can use that reason reasoning technique to prove that theorem that we got stuck on a second ago. Recall, we're trying to prove that n plus 0 equals n. We'll go ahead and introduce n. And we'll do almost the same thing we did before with destruct. I mean, this is kind of like a case analysis. We're going to do two cases, one for the base case, one for the inductive case, which is to say one for when n is 0 and one for when n is 1 bigger than some other natural number. And the syntax will look much the same. We're saying, let's do induction on n. And we have an, an intros pattern here, just like we did for destruct. And you can think of this here as we're writing down the case here for O and the case here for S, but we just don't write the, the constructor names. In the case of S, we want to give a name to the data carried by the constructor. So this is the smaller natural number inside of it. But we get one more piece of information here, one more name that we get to give which is an inductive hypothesis. This will give us the inductive hypothesis that we're used to having from the inductive step uh, in a proof by induction. That'll be simpler to explain once we get it, actually get into that step. So let's do that. We do the induction. We get two sub goals, one for when n is 0, another one for when n is the successor of some other natural number n prime. Remember, we chose that name n prime right here ourselves. Focus in on that first one to prove that 0 plus 0 equals 0. That, of course, is easy. We do that by reflexivity. And now we get into the inductive case. So let's pause now and take a close look at the, the hypotheses that Koch put in place. We've got a natural number n prime. That's not surprising. That was that smaller natural number that's inside uh, that n is equal to. But now we have an inductive hypothesis about n prime. Now, the name of that hypothesis we got to choose up here. The content of the hypothesis, Koch figured out for us. What it did was to figure out the proposition we were trying to prove for all natural numbers. Actually, that was the goal right here before the induction. We were trying to prove that n plus 0 equals n for any natural number. So Koch went ahead and instantiated that, but replaced n by n prime. 
that smaller natural number that was inside of the S constructor. So one, one of the really beautiful things, one of the fun things about working with Koch at this point, I think, is if you've ever tried to keep track of these inductive hypotheses, or maybe you were trying to learn to do proofs by induction and you ever got confused by what the inductive hypothesis actually ought to be, uh, good news, Koch does that bookkeeping for you. It figures it out for you and stocks that inductive hypothesis into your proof context here. And that's kind of a nice thing. Uh, you may even find that because of that, as you study these inductive hypotheses, you get better at doing proofs by induction on paper uh, because it clears out clears up any doubts you might have had about how to construct the how to instantiate an inductive hypothesis correctly. Okay, so we've got the inductive hypothesis that n prime plus zero equals n prime. Let's finish off the proof from there. Okay, look at the goal. There's actually a step of simplification that's possible here because we have a plus where the left-hand side has a successor. We talked about that before. So we can simplify that. That pulls the successor out front and now we've got n prime plus zero. Ah, that's something that's up here in our hypotheses. In fact, our inductive hypothesis says that n prime plus zero is n prime. So we could use rewrite substitute equals for equals. We're going to replace the n prime plus zero with n prime. Remember the rewrite tactic says which direction you want to go. Here we're saying go from left to right across that equality. And here we name the equality that we're, we're using. So that replaces the n prime plus zero over here with just n prime. We're left now with successor of n prime equals successor of n prime. Well, that is just an instance of reflexivity and that finishes off the proof for us. So there we go. That was our proof, first proof by induction in Koch.